Um, we asked you on Instagram and Facebook any questions, and boy, you amazing people, you did not disappoint. You have asked us, can I say quite literally hundreds of questions, some of them very personal, and we really appreciate your honesty, some just amazing, some downright strange. So uh, you guys are fascinating in your breadth and your diversity. So um, we're just going to start with the ones that we think, oh, yes, we've actually got a helpful answer to that. We, we don't know all things. David might know a lot of things, but we don't know all things. So we're going to do uh, today and next Thursday just bashing through that list and see where we get to. And some of them we deliberately haven't talked about publicly because some of them are actually quite controversial. But of course, you won't let us get away with, with hiding what we feel about the vaccine uh, or hiding what we feel, uh, uh, you know, about all those injections that are now semi-mandatory in our country. So I thought at one point, oh, we'll just not talk about the vaccine because it's so controversial. But no, you have given us a whole page of vaccine questions. So shall we start off with the vaccine? And shall we uh, alienate at least half of you? Not intentionally, but uh, we'll we'll do our best to be biblical. Uh, but uh, we'll start we'll start off there. And uh, don't stone us in the comments if you disagree. Okay. Well, I David, do you want to start, and I'll come in in the back, or will I start and you come in in the back? Because you have lots of thoughts. Uh, on 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 the big question on the vaccine or will I on the vaccine you're starting you're starting there I thought you were going to start on the do you like chocolate or not <laughs> but no you're you're straight you're straight in on the big question <laughs> yeah yes do you want me to start and then I'll look. yes go on yeah I'll start and then David will jump in and and keep us right huh. I think we got to look at two things when it comes to this. First of all is we have different cultural approaches. And we have some cultures that are uh, absolutely focused on my rights and individual rights, the empowerment of the individual. And those nations tend to be more right in their uh, politics, kind of center right and, and on that spectrum. And they really believe I get to choose my rights. And of course, they start off with an inherent suspicion about anything that is mandated. They start off with a predisposition to be closed minded to anything that looks too much like control or an agenda being thrust on them or forced on them. So you got to know that you start from a cultural perspective. Some of the rest of you and in fact, some entire nations start off more on the left of the political spectrum. And those on the left of the political spectrum start by thinking, oh, what is my societal responsibility? And so those who start with what is my societal responsibility think, oh, I don't mind paying a price for society because paying a price for society and the common good, I do that all the time even if it costs me. So we start from a right based, uh, uh, how dare you, I will have my rights, don't you dare. Or we start from a society, I'm prepared to pay the cost, okay? And, so, and Emma, at, at that yes. moment, it, I think it's worth saying that, um, sorry, I'm getting echo too today. It's funny not being behind the scenes. Um, the that that those two approaches we'll have in in the comments and those of you watching today some of you will be um you've said left and right um uh, communitarian and libertarian whatever your language is for that we'll be on both sides and on whatever side what i would encourage you as you as you watch and listen to it is think can i be can I learn from people who hold the other opinion so yeah. if you're on the side of um that more societal um, think about can I learn from those who are more individual and the other way around if I'm more individual can I learn from those who are more uh, societal and and so think about it like that let's not have an argument who's right who's wrong which side should Christians be on but actually how can we learn from each other in this how can we examine do I have a preconceived 
prejudice or cultural eye lens to this um, as we go. Okay, so then we so we just have to understand we've got a cultural default fault, we've got a political default. Now then you layer that with some scripture, okay? And I would go straight to Romans 14. And it says this, one person's faith, I'm reading directly, this is verse two, one person's faith allows them to eat anything. Do you remember the big conversation in the early church is do we eat food sacrificed to idols or not? Is it clean or is it unclean? But we we lift this principle and we apply, apply it. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another's whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the ones who does, for God has accepted them all. And so this is the place where the, the, the word of God is saying, do you have faith for it? Do you have faith for it? And so you don't judge those who don't, but we go to Romans 14, and we ask the question, do you have faith for the vaccine? And so Paul is really saying, I think there, if you have faith for something, take it. If you don't have faith for something, don't take it. But you don't judge because God has accepted all. Now, interestingly, this pushes on verse five, it's straight out of scripture, verse five. One person considers one day more sacred than another, others consider every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind, okay? So what that is saying is, look, some of you follow every festival, every feast day, you are really rigorous in your observance of things, but some of you don't follow any of them because to you every day is holy. And that gives this great grace from God to do it according to your faith. All right, so let's nail our colors to the mask. In fact, verse 12, go and read the whole of Romans 14. Verse 12 then goes on to say, each of us will give an account of ourselves before God. Yep. So, um, yeah, have I had the vaccine? Yes, because I have faith for it. I had mine a few weeks ago. Has Sarah Jane had the vaccine? Yes, she's got faith for it. Is David getting the vaccine? You've not had it, you're getting yours tomorrow at half 12. So have we had the vaccine? Yes. Now, why is that? Because we have faith for it. And because we happen to be more in that societal responsibility mindset. And even if there's a weakness in that, we're prepared to go with that and run out with the consequences of that because we have faith. So that I hope that answers the question. David, add, add to that. Yeah, I, another encouragement alongside that is um, when you're making decisions about anything, use Holy Spirit discernment. Do not use fear. If fear is in any part of your thinking, you need to stop yourself and, and spend time with the Holy Spirit. Get yourself back to that place of faith. Get yourself back to, the, again, as Emma says, what do I have faith for? So that you're making decisions based on faith of the Holy Spirit, faith in God, trust in God, and not fear. Um, there's a lot of fear. I've even seen it in the comments, fear about this, fear about that, speculation on this and that. And some of it comes to do with some um, rather skewed interpretations of uh, of end times things, which which makes people suspicious. But actually, you need to you need to step away from all fear, step away from um, places that are making you fearful. And that includes some videos that you might watch online and go back to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, settle me in my spirit about the decision that I'm taking. Um, can I just address one um, comment that, that has come up in the in in the the uh, in the comments? Um, and that is about um, are the vaccines um, full of aborted fetuses. Um, now, I'm not a medic, but I do. Um, I am passionate about science. Um, I, I studied science for many years. I have spoken to scientists. I've researched a lot, but you need to do your own search and research from trustworthy, reliable sources on this. Um, the uh, and and I'm obviously pro-life as well. When I when I say this, the some of the vaccines don't involve fetal cells at all. 
they are not involved in that. The Pfizer vaccine in the UK is mRNA. It's not fetal cells at all. Other vaccines are taken from a cell line from the, I think it's the kidney of a child who was aborted in the 1970s in the Netherlands. And the Oxford vaccine is that. So what scientists did was they took the cells from a child who had died. We don't know whether they were deliberately killed by the mother or whether um, they yeah, died I mean, some other Yeah, can I just... In that, in, in those that's days really, days. really, really, really important. Abortion was illegal at that point. So it's unlikely to have been abor an aborted baby. Come on, guys. We got to be a little bit more academically intelligent. You can't just say, oh, there's abortion in it. There's an abortion in it. When actually abortion wasn't even illegal. So they wouldn't have been using that. It, well, it, 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 it didn't exist. But remember, remember, I used to work for um, a pregnancy care charity as my first paid job. Remember, what do you call early days miscarriage? What is the medical term for a miscarriage? spontaneous abortion you've got to know these things so when they're taking a spontaneous abortion that is actually miscarriage so actually you're taking for something that the body has lost yeah but but yeah, yes okay we're going one place i'm not sure i'm happy to go but yeah <clears throat> and and so, but in terms of what people are, are are saying about that they're killing babies and putting them into the vaccines that's not what's happening there was a tragedy and whether that was a man-made tragedy or a, there, there was a tragedy at the start of all this, and they took the a cell, cell line from that kidney of that child um, back then. So there you have a, a moral dilemma on that. Am I happy with that? Am I not? But that's the question around one of the vaccines there. Yeah. I think the other thing is somebody in the comments is saying, don't you believe God protects you? Of course he does. But God has protected me many times through the gift of medicine. Medicine is not the absence of God. Medicine is, the, is often the gift of God. And I think God loves healing spontaneous miracles as much as he loves the skilled hand of a surgeon. And I think to God, medicine is not second rate or second best. I think what God doesn't like is when we come to him second. I think God says, you come to me first and I'll guide you in, are we in spontaneous miracle or are we in the miracle of the intelligence of the surgeon? I've had eight lots of abdominal surgery over my life. I am thankful to God for the medicine that he has allowed to come on planet earth. We go into it with prayer, we go into it with due diligence as long as God is for first and I am and I have the faith for uh, that. Oh, well, that was interesting in the comments, wasn't it? Yeah. Your salvation has <laughs> even been questioned. Our salvation Somebody's saying I'm not even a proper Christian. <laughs> Marvellous. Sarah Jane, let's hear your voice. Why don't you read another one of the questions and let's go a different direction? OK. Awesome. Um, I think there was a few questions on economic shaking and we, we probably want to go to the another big theme of the season that we're in with the prophets prophesying about the shaking continuing. And so we've seen last year and the whole pandemic that we're still seeing across nations being affected, such as India and Brazil, et cetera, et cetera, more than we are right now here in the in the UK, the British Isles and elsewhere. What other shaking is going on? And a couple of you had specific questions. I can't actually remember the exact wording, but it was something like, is the economic shaking affecting North America uh, or alone or other nations as well? And there was also, is the economic shaking still continuing? And there was other questions around that. The Lord is saying that the, the economic shaking continues. We are at the beginning of the breaking of the ground and the breaking of the foundations of the economic structures on the earth. And we are in a process where God is saying, I am tearing down and I am uprooting those foundational pieces uh, from even previous reformations of e economics, even over, I feel like the last thousand years, where we've come in as human beings to say, what's most important is where I make wealth and I can make a profit. And so we saw things like um, 
Andrew Carnegie in 1889, for example, who wrote a paper uh, which has been termed as the gospel of wealth. And we saw all of our trajectory over make money, make profit and give your profit away philanthropically, if that's philanthropically, um, be generous and change society. And I feel like the Lord is saying, actually, it's the end of those days where, where wealth in a few hands made a difference to society. And we are flipping things around, he's saying, where we're coming to the economics of mutuality. To get there, there is a shaking of foundations. There is a breaking of foundations. So you'll be feeling under your feet personally, or you should be, how am I managing my personal finances? Where am I putting my money? What am I earning financially? And what am I doing with that? Lord, give me a new vision for the mutuality of economics that is coming to the earth and is on the earth now. What is economics of mutuality? Mutuality means who am I benefiting? Um, people and what land am I benefiting? Because it's the Leviticus 25 model of Jubilee economics. It's about giving land rest and giving people rest. And so there's too much of that teaching probably um, that we can go into uh, in a shallow way right now, but we can teach on that more another time if we need to. But there's that sense of actually the Lord saying the foundations of what has been built on personal wealth, sustaining personal wealth, those structures that have said profit is the aim, wealth is the aim, God is shaking. And nations that have put their hopes in wealth for solutions, like Andrew Carnegie's phrase of the gospel of wealth, money is where it's at. The Lord is saying to us, nations uh, who rely on money and wealth will not save nations in this hour. And it's the economics of mutuality where we're at. So expect that shaking to continue through this decade, expect that shaking to continue beyond this decade and actually be asking the Lord, how do I steward my finances and what what are we to do with them? It is all, all new in that regard as we enter into this new era. The shaking will continue in all nations and it will manifest in different ways. And so we will see China become the Joseph of nations. God is giving China uh, a a solution to help nations economically. Now we can see that as a threat and go, China's trying to control things, or we can see it as what I believe it is, another controversial thought, guys, that actually God is using China to save nations from themselves, where wealth has become the dominant goal. And so this, this communal wealth process of economics of mutuality is a journey, I believe, that we're going on as the people of God over this next decade into 50 years. And I won't be around, I don't think, uh, when we see the fullness of this coming out the other end, but we are on that journey. How about this? Haven't we as church and as church leaders, you know, we enter into that thought as well, but as business people, myself and my husband and, and David and Emma, you've worked in corporate world and and earned, earned salaries in that in that way, where people, church leaders particularly, look at business people and think, actually, I need your money power. Yeah, I need your money power. And there's this warped sense of what the money can do and what money can do to shape things. And actually, God is saying, people of God, step back. Yes, I'm giving you resources. But where you have said, this is how I will change things. Money has power. I think we've probably all thought that because that's our cultural norm in the West. The Lord is saying, I'm shaking that. I am shaking that. I am resetting your thought about finances. And so expect that to come to you personally. Expect it to come to your own sense of how we deal with our own resources, home, money, salary, uh, what we own, um, and think, God, give me the mindset of the economics of mutuality, which is Leviticus 25, of how can I bring rest to people and how can I bring rest to land? And what does that then look like when we think about what is in our hands? So there's, yeah, there's a lot to say on that, but that would be my top line. Brilliant, Sir Jane. David, do you want to jump in on that? Re really, I mean, uh, these are deep, deep thoughts because of the nature of the re 
uh, set that God is doing right across the face of the earth. And we are going to see China rise as a par uh, in the world. And we are going to see the West uh, in a diminishing place. Uh, and, and that I do think God is behind and God is backing that. Uh, and that is massively challenging for those of us in the West who want to lead and to want to be in front and we want yeah. to be in charge and we want to be in control and we want our greed and we want our individualism and we want our rights and we want our mm -hmm. independence and we want our superiority and we want to subjugate other nations and we want to have mm -hmm. it our way and we want trade deals that bless us only and we want to be able to have that colonial mindset still in us that we might rape other nations and that they might you know mm. oh, how high does your quality of living actually need to go I mean how many cars do you actually need that are elite mm -hmm. you know and so on this God is saying I actually am going to shake the West because the West has been greedy independent and an uh, individual and not being a good elder statesman in the blessing of other nations. And we have an ugly, ugly, ugly colonial past, an ugly yes. colonial past, all of the Western nations. And I do believe that God is saying, look, I'm gonna move the balance of par because mm -hmm. you have sinned. Now, does that mean China is beautiful and brilliant and clean and pure? Absolutely not. But the whole way through the history of the world, God uses unrighteous war, unrighteous wars, and he has unrighteous people fight unrighteous people. And whoever is the least unrighteous wins. So nobody is saying, oh, China is pure. We're just saying we are really unrighteous and are going to come into a diminishing place because of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we've got to be ready to be um, have our, our thoughts and our opinions shaken. You know, the current, the status quo right now suits us. It suits us. It suits me. It suits my ministry. It suits my lifestyle to have yeah. the status quo stay as it is for the next, I don't know how many hundred centuries. Great. Very, we'll be very blessed here in Scotland. Our ministry will be very blessed. We'll do what we did. We'll do it bigger and better and bolder with more lights and more sounds. But, but that's not how we're to be as Christians. We're to hold our hands, everything that we hold in our hands, and say to God, "Will you shake me? Will you sift me? Will you, will you clean my hands? Show me what's impure in my heart. Show me other ways." So when there is a time of shaking, like uh, Sarah Jane is is talking about, we shouldn't be desperate to hold on to things as they always were because that must be the right way. We must always, and and if our hearts bristle at that, and I know that some of our hearts do bristle at it. Mine does when you hear things mm -hmm. about the. My heart goes, wait, but wait a minute, what will that mean mm -hmm. for? What will that? Mm -hmm. But we have to say, oh, my heart bristled there. Am I holding on to something too strongly? It's the mm -hmm. same when the prophets say something else, like earlier in the in the conversation. Mm -hmm. When when you say something and it causes you after 149 episodes of traveling with these prophets, suddenly the prophet says something that you disagree with and you're ready to throw oh, everything okay. out because you're a oh, I mean, yes, I mean you've it's gotta, so rude. Gotta, it's so rude gotta, to say. Yeah, it's you've so good. You've got to ask yourself, why why am I holding on to something? And God, would you help me examine myself? That doesn't mean we're right or wrong, but it does mean that you've got to examine yourself on it. Um, someone just asked, um, the economics of mutuality that you mentioned, Sarah Jane, is that different from, how is that different from philanthropy? And and I think the what the economics of mutuality does is give them the, the ability to... Um, uh, survive and thrive into the hands rather than it being handouts but the ability to to thrive Sarah Jane yeah no so the you know what we would have thought of as capitalism and actually what we've all gone and cheered about is you know make profit make profit and give it away you know be as rich as you can be as wealthy as you can and we've all probably done a happy dance um in, us in be church. as rich as we can yeah, we've yeah, us be as rich as we can, or even our churches. And we've all done a happy dance when we've had wealthy yeah. people join our churches. I think we have to out that uh, and say we have. We've said, you know, great, we can now maybe afford this, or we've gone to to wealthy Christians, or we've looked, you know, who knows the wealthy Christians, so we can ask them for money. That you know, it, it's not that. <laughs> It's not that it's completely wrong, but God is shifting the agenda. Where, and where we have said, that's mine, you know, and I'm going to give it away. The Lord is saying, no, that's mine. That's mine. 
and I'm going to give it away. And I think we we have done this. And as you're talking about it, David, I feel that That's we have it. done this a lot and said, I'm having it this way. And I'm happy to have it this way. But God, if you're saying now that actually if I can't have it to give it away and you're doing things differently, the mutuality aspect is not what is how do I make the best profit? It is two questions that come first. It is how do I bless and give rest to people and how do I bless and give rest to land? God, you know, where do I put my money? Um, well, your money. How do I steward that? And what does that look like? And let me tell you, I've been on this journey for some months. I've had my heart bristle. God said to me, I want you to pray for Asia, the continent of Asia. And he started to show me his heart for Asia and what he was doing in China, and what he was doing in that whole realm of the world. God is showing us that East Gate of Nations is his focus right now. It's not that other nations aren't important, but he's saying, look, people of God, look at what I'm doing. I want you to pray and I want you to hear and I want you to see what I'm saying about China and Asia. And let me tell you, it will make you bristle more than you ever did thought. You you thought you had the pure hearted uh, sort of intentions of God until you start praying for a nation that you feel you have been programmed and almost like culturally washed to think that's our enemy. That's our enemy. God said in one time we were praying, China is not your enemy. China is not your enemy. He kept saying it over and over again. And, and I was I was literally, like David said, bristling at the thought. But when you put yourself in that position, say, Lord, if you've got the thought of a nation as an enemy or a person as an enemy, ask the Lord for his heart for that person or for that nation. You will change your perception, your cultural DNA in that situation and your instinctive response will change. And so, mm -hmm. you know, you look at the Gateses, you look at the Bezoses and what God is even doing with them. We, we see Melinda and Bill Gates in the news today about their marriage breaking up. See these as signs of what God is doing. He is drawing our attention to the way of philanthropy that was profit, 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 Give it away, change society. Andrew Carnegie, famous for that. He was born yeah. up the road from me in Dunfermline. This is about anybody can make a difference in society. Think, how do I bless people and how do I bless land? Yeah, and I think this is, real, this is really, really, really tough. And hear what we're saying. Do we like what, we're, what God is telling us? Do, do we like what God is telling us? No, we don't. Are we bristling inside? Yes, we are. Does this mean that God doesn't love all nations? No. Does it mean God stops having a plan for America or the British Isles? No, of course it doesn't. Does it mean that God doesn't want us to be saved? No, no, He want, of course he wants us all to be saved. But we have squandered our leadership in the world with our greed. Mm. And we have led for a thousand years of history. Do you not think that's good enough? that God actually says another mindset and another cultural approach now needs to challenge the world. So we, we, are, we, are, we are prophesying, not because we like it, but because God is saying it, that there will be the rise of China as a part and the rise of Asia, and he will bless that. And the West will not stop stop existing, but it will diminish in its role uh, as being the center of planet Earth. Yeah. Not easy, is it? Ooh. No, I mean, I actually just taught on a private channel. How long did I teach on Thursday night? 13, two hours on this. I know it was intense. And I did say to David this morning, do I just need to do a special broadcast to explain this really strongly? For But you'd have to listen to my voice for about two hours for me to do it justice. If you want me to do two hours of teaching on exactly why this is happening more than I can do in 20 minutes here, I might do a special broadcast, but not if you're going to stone me for doing it. <laughs> but okay. There's always uh, Yes, yes, yeah, typed stones, uh, because actually, uh, does that mean we'll be communists? I don't think so. I think their cultural ideas will start to uh, shape us. Um, uh, you see, see, tell me this, what Chinese or Asian worship leader are you following? 
because they have a completely different way to stewarding the presence of God. We only know how to approach the presence of God through a Western way, don't we? We, we only follow Western worship leaders. We only follow Western teachers. We've actually completely dismissed how the Asians find Jesus. We've dismissed how the Asians read scripture. We've dismissed how the Asians worship. A completely different mindset. Totally, totally different mindset. Because we think ours is the only way. Right. Yeah, I think, and, we, the West is getting reformed. China is also China getting also reformed. reformed. And their economic and their system, system, system and structure is getting reformed. There's a whole new way that God is bringing, but he's going to bring it through China. So what you see there isn't necessarily what is going to get replicated. It is being shaped even now, this economics of mutuality. But because China has the fertile ground, because they think about people in the way that some of us don't like, God's saying, I'll use them and I will show you the model from there. Wow, wow, wow. So now that, um, uh, now that we've done uh, the COVID vaccine and the rise of China, shall we... <laughs> <laughs> There's some other controversial questions. I, you didn't give us an easy ride with these questions. Oh, you can understand why we've kept uh, uh, some things to ourselves, but you asked. Shall we, shall we have some nice questions before I pick out another controversial one? Uh, uh, there are great questions on delivering children of demons. But David, you have a little pet hobby horse in here. Uh, uh, somebody has asked, how do you deal with um, uh, people who are cessational now, cessationalism is the belief that uh, prophecy is not allowed, it's unscriptural, tongues are not allowed, that God doesn't, uh, you know, work in miracles, signs and wonders or prophecy anymore. And actually quite a lot of the church still hold those beliefs uh, that those things ceased, the things that we build our lives around, that those things ceased at the end of the early church. So somebody saying, now say something on climate change. Do you know I have a whole teaching on climate change? But uh, even I might not go there. Uh, so uh, not today, uh, not today uh, on climate change. But David, do you want to answer the question on cessationalism that the gifts ended at the end of the early church? Uh, yes, I, I, I'm not sure this is necessarily um, another non-controversial subject because I'm, I'm going to be more bold than I perhaps have been over the course of the last 20 years. And the reason I say the last 20 years is because I was cessationalist. I was brought up in a, a, a very strongly cessationalist culture. Um, Scotland as a nation is dyed in the wool, cessationalist as a as a thing. But actually what, what was probably more accurate was um, I, I didn't know that there was any gifts or even much about the Holy Spirit. So it was more ignorant than actually being anti something because I didn't even know about the thing that I was anti about. But certainly yeah. if you'd gone deeper into the doctrines that I was brought up with, I was, I was broadly cessationalist. Gifts had ceased. The signs, wonders, and miracles that we read about in Scripture had, had, um, had ceased. And that's how I was brought up. And it wasn't until um, I started to meet people who believed a different opinion that I started to look again at scripture and I was like, well, this is all in my Bible. This is the book I believe in. I am going to start to believe in it. And it was a, it was a fair old wrestle in our, in our student years or our, our late, late uh, teens and, and early twenties. Emma and I wrestled over these things ourselves. And, and, um, but what I would say in answer to the question, what do I say to someone who is, who is challenging me on this is that for, a long time, I think we who believe in the gifts of the Spirit, who believe in the power of the Spirit, who believe that signs, wonders, miracles, the signs of the kingdom are for today, we've been on the back foot and felt that we have to justify our position and we have been called the heretics. Actually, the truth is that cessationalists are the heretics, if ever there was. They are the oh. ones... I, I'm, I'm serious. You now, just called them heretics! Look, they're my Good brothers... Night. And sisters in Christ, uh, this is not a. This is not something that um, I, I would still take a bullet for them, um, for sure. But we've got to start being more positive about what the Bible says about um, miracles, signs, wonders, healings, the signs of the kingdom, and and actually there are there are three or four, if even that one plus two, three, four sort of verses that are proof texts that people use to try and justify that these things don't happen nowadays. But they're, it's, it's, it's simply uh, the case that they are proof texts taken out of context to try and justify something that actually is based on 
I don't see it happening with my own eyes, so therefore it can't be true, and I will build a theology around it. We have to be more positive about what the Bible actually says about what is what is possible. And the, yeah. the early church fathers all believed this. Justin Martyr, Arrhenius, Gregory. Um, Tertullian. Ter Augustine, he changed his yeah. mind. He he wasn't initially, but he, you know th this is this is not something that is new to the the, the last century. No, absolutely. And I think what fascinates me is uh, in Revelation, I've talked about it a lot, Revelation 11, when you get the rise of the two prophets, uh, that God actually has in his end times calendar. You asked us a lot about the end times, but we'll not do that today because that requires whole power hours. But in God's end time calendar, he does raise prophets up to steward his word in the nations. It's part of God's end time plan. And I think there is that sense of, you know, you will completely um, have no ability to work with that if you don't believe prophecy is for today. It's how God works in the latter days of the earth and these prophets who rise up. And of course, you will have heard me say many times that actually what, what, what I feel we're doing is creating the culture and creating the environment where prophets of that kind of substance can start to have a hope of growing so that God has got prophets on the earth when he needs them for that moment. Yeah. So uh, that's a massive motivation for me. So uh, I, I think, David, you're right that the we don't need to prove anything. I think cessationists do need to come up with some better, more biblically robust uh, uh, arguments. I think I think they need to answer. Here's here's some uh, a scripture um, to, to perhaps that will help the, the, the person asking the question. Um, th someone who argues from the, uh, the the opposing point would need to um, address James chapter 5, verse 13. It, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. And then he goes on because he knows that what he said is controversial. He knows that he'll get kicked back. And he says, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years again he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops uh, my brothers and sisters if any of you should wonder from the truth that someone should bring that person uh, back remember this and 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 he goes on james is dealing with the argument there he says elijah was was not just special he was a human being even as we are and he did these miracles so you know it, just one scripture where James addresses that problem. Um, there's there's great resources. D.A. Carson, uh, Gordon Fee, Jack Deere, Wayne Grudem, Sam Storms. Um, great writers. Craig, yeah. Craig Craner. There's, there's lots of heavyweight theologians who can help um, with that. Heavyweight respected theologians who will help with that. Great. Woo. Sarah Jane, do you want to pick another one? We've got some questions about deliverance. We could do those. Sure. Um, there was a there was one actually specifically that we both I think um, had highlighted, yeah, Emma, I I... which I think is is relevant for anybody really who has somebody who's suffered with trauma in their lives. Uh, what to do when your eighteen year old needs deliverance from trauma from sexual assault? That mm -hmm. that was a very specific question. And I think yeah. um, Emma yeah. and I had had seen that one and thought, yeah, actually, we can talk into that uh -huh. because it's not just for that one question and one that one person, but many many people have suffered with trauma even in this last uh, year, and many people have suffered with um, abusive trauma, sexual abuse, or verbal verbal and physical abuse. And so, what do you do when you have had this this trauma appear? I think going back to the first question, we don't disregard help that we can get that is outside of spiritual. We, we don't want yeah. to over spiritualize everything and just say it's all spiritual in root because there are great resources out there. We will get to the spiritual bit. But I think what's important to say is we do rely on things like talking therapy and counseling. You know, we do rely on things like, you know, if somebody is depressed because of trauma, then they go and talk to the doctor about antidepressants because there can be a chemical imbalance that needs antidepressants so we don't disregard what's available help 
outside of the spiritual world and outside of the spiritual context. We look at everything that is available to somebody who's had a traumatic experience. But I think spiritually specifically, then we can do a number of things. First of all, we can bind shock and trauma, whether the person is a Christian and given a life to Jesus or not. We can bind it and say, you know, I bind shock and trauma on this person and off this person's body and life. Uh, and that is a very effective prayer that gives people space to be able to move out of the initial phase, if you will, of the onslaught of mental, emotional and physical responses to trauma. Um, and so binding that is, is a really good thing. Uh, you bind the strong man first. We, we read that as a, as a biblical principle. The second thing I would say is, if they, if they know Jesus or they don't and they're willing to meet with Jesus, that is a great place to start. Yeah. Uh, and just pray with them to uh, invite Jesus to meet with them. And we can be amazed and surprised at how many people who've never seen Jesus, never experienced him, are immediately aware of him in proximity yeah. to their physical frame and to their heart and to their emotions and their spirit. And that even some of them who have never seen anything in the spirit before or sensed anything in the spirit before, immediately they're aware of him. And so the closer the proximity of Jesus to them, the easier it is to get healed. And there is that sense of inviting Jesus to meet with them is a great place to start. Um, Emma, do you want to comment on any of that? Yeah, that I mean... Thoughts? Yes, uh, there's a question tied with it. Can, can children need deliverance? The answer is yes. And mm -hmm. if so, how do you deal with it age appropriately? Let me talk through that. And I think an 18 year old, because of course I have an 18 year old, you're on that cusp, aren't you? Although technically you're an adult, there's still a lot of things that, that need to grow uh, inside you. So I want to comment on both of those. Um, I actually rang my, rang my daughter earlier and said, can I tell some of her story? She was really badly bullied at the first primary. She said, yes the first primary so it was your tiny tiny uh, uh little one at that time and so age appropriately i would have done two things first of all i would have said to her let's just draw you and we would have just got the pens out we draw we color in the shape that jessica is i've done this for many 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 children over the years I don't want them to see the demon i don't really want to, to name it a demon uh, at that point but i want them to say where is that sore thing? Where is, where, give it a color, give it a shape and draw it. Where's that pain? Where's that hurt? Now, very often for a child, I've never met a child who couldn't do this. I know that there's something stuck in me here. I know that, and I sometimes they'll name it fear, anger, trauma, but children often don't. It's just, I'm sore. Very often it's just, I'm sore, okay? That's all that they can express. I have a pain. So we're identifying it. Why do I want them to identify it? Because I want them to know when it's gone. And I want them to be able to replace it with Jesus. So I need to lead them to the place where they actually have a little bit of an eyes on. Now, as they get older uh, and, and we move out of the coloring in phase, I will say, do a Holy Spirit MRI scan. Look down your body. Tell me where the sorbet is. Tell me where the pain is in your body. People tell you all sorts of weird and wonderful places. Very often it's over sexual organs and that would indicate a certain sort of trauma. But very often, you know, uh, the children will say, it's on my right leg, you know, or it's on my arm. A lot of it, it's in the heart too. Now, at that point, you're identifying something of the demonic and you're probably identifying an emotional wounding. And they need two different approaches. The only way, the only, only, only way you can get them fixed is if Jesus can take the place of that. Getting that thing off them is the easy bit. I bind you in Jesus' name. Get out in Jesus' name. I lift that off you. Any demonic rawness, any demonic trauma. Now, you and I can do that just like that because we have authority in the name of Jesus. The skill is not shifting the trauma or the demon, the skill is in the placing of Jesus in its place. It's, it's a replacement of Jesus in that place. Now, 
What that means is you have got to go on journeys of where is Jesus? Is he safe? Is he kind for you? Let's talk to Jesus, see him, know where he's at. Because the very second that comes out, Jesus must, must go in. And so what I find particularly and, 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 my children, I said to Jessica today, do you, obviously she's left home and gone to university. She says, mommy, I do it all the time now. I do self-deliverance all the time uh, because of what you've taught me. I know uh, the demon is there. I tell it to go. I invite Jesus back in. I work with Jesus in that. That should be normal. And for an 18 year old, she just knows that's how it works. Now, sexual trauma and sexual assault. We've dealt with that a lot because there's a lot of it around. The problem there is most people who are sexually assaulted are women and most of them have an anti-men bias. And I have taken sometimes up to 18 months to get a trauma victim or a sexual assault victim to talk to Jesus properly. I will not start with the deliverance. I will start with, can we chat to Jesus? Can you chat to Jesus? Um, can you ask him where he was when this happened? Can we go through what he thinks about it, what he says about it? Just can you hold hands with Jesus? You are just reconnecting to the only source that can heal you. Now, when you trust Jesus, then we're in the demonite Jesus in. But you have a journey of loving Jesus and, and connecting with him. And I have taken with sometimes with people, as I said, 18 months plus, plus, just to get Jesus and them to sit at a table and talk. I said to people, could I invite Jesus into the room? No. Could I invite Jesus to just to stand the other side of the room so you can look at each other? No way. Okay. Where was Jesus? He wasn't good. Now, when you know Jesus is the source of healing, that's when those things actually will go and stay away. Okay. Now somebody's asking me a, a question about schizophrenia. I actually am going to talk on Thursday about mental health and demonic and dissociation identity disorder because that did come up in your questions. Woo! Thursday is going to be controversial too. So, um, cause of course I, I uh, worked in mental health for years. So, uh, that's a fun one, but this is just answering the deliverance portion of it first. Other thoughts, uh, Sarah Jane. Yeah, just a couple of other things. I think we know from experience that the person who's had the trauma, uh, often has body memory. And so I think it's, it's, it's releasing the trauma from the body and laying hands on the person. So as they're working with Jesus, and as Emma's talking about that, as ministers, we can lay hands on and say, we give the body permission to let go of the trauma. We give, you know, the emotions permission to give the trauma to Jesus. And we uh, release that sense of permission to receive peace from Jesus and it is a conversational piece with the person who has had the trauma with Jesus and he will speak directly to them and so it is getting them to ask questions and receiving that peace uh, as well another top tip I think that we've learned over the years is memories and how memories store the trauma and so one of the things that God had us do many years ago was to put put ha our hand on the back of people's heads. And I actually initially never realized what it was we were doing. We would be praying for separation of trauma and pain from memory and emotions and bringing a separation there. So as a minister who is praying with somebody, you can do that and have them put their hand there or you put the hand there. Why is that important? Well, in our brain, the amygdala and the hippocampus are here. And the amygdala holds the, the fear memories and will trigger those fear memories. And so actually releasing peace to the memories and asking God to do divine edit of memories, which he will do. I've seen it happen time and again um, and separate emotions from those fear memories so that you get space for the, those people to work with Jesus. Those are the top tips that I would give. Also decrees no limitations over your life, freedom, spaciousness over your life as they're beginning to work with Jesus. We make room for Jesus for you to find Jesus. Those kinds of prayers can be prayed in the room and also over them when they're not with you to expedite that process of healing. Um, some people get, get healed 
in a moment. I mean, Emma, you're going to talk about dissociation on Thursday. I've seen people who've been dissociated for years come together in a moment when Jesus is on it, when Holy Spirit is on it. Um, but some people have gone through years of, of journeying with God to get to that place. Others haven't, and God just does a supernatural work. There, there isn't a method, but there are tools that we can use that, we, that we've just shared. So have to get you have to get intimate with Jesus to get healed and you have to get intimate with Jesus for a deliverance to hold there's no way around that now David because we've only got two more minutes left and because we've been controversial enough and because lots of people asked you lots of things about our relationship do you want to answer any of them and then they said what is David's favorite movie how does David like his eggs would David rather have toes for fingers or fingers for toes I mean there was a hole from the sublime to the ridiculous so David tell us <laughs> <laughs> um yes uh which one do you, what, what do you want to know the answer well, you, about? Can, you can people ask most about our marriage they ask a lot oh. about that actually. oh it's wonderful what else? Next question. <laughs> how we met and all of oh, that. Oh, how we met. That story. Do you know, actually, it goes back to the cessational thing, uh, cessationalist thing, um, that actually I, I was... I wanted to be spirit filled. I had. Uh, I wanted to pray in tongues. I wanted to be, uh, you know, come into all of that, and um, had been struggling with it. Had been wrestling with it. So Emma and I went to the uh, the vicar of our church um, to have a meeting with him, and he did a sneaky on me. And uh, instead of sitting You'd down with us to address those questions, yes. Oh, I had. Yes, you're right. I had read to him. him. Pre mobile phones, pre the internet. Oh, yes. you got and paper and said i don't believe in the gifts of the spirit but i'd like to know the holy spirit can you help yes yes i, I it must have it must have been something like that yeah i didn't have the internet to write comments on so i wrote him a letter um but it was a, it was a genuine it was a searching um question at the time but he did a sneaky and rather than address that question he went straight in for the juggler and um uh said you two are boyfriend and girlfriend are you sleeping together was his first That's question to first us first question which uh which he said no yes. yeah we said no um and then um, what did he say next he said he um, said do you love each other do you love each other? And um, I thought, I'm not answering this. I want to see what David says. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that question had necessarily come up um, uh, at that, that that point yet. No, no, um, we were just thinking. And so you uh, said, yes. what did you say? You said yes. And then he said, are you in love? And you and said, yes. Yes. And, I, and then he said, are you going to get married? And I thought, this is a moment where I've got to learn how to be silent. We've not had this conversation. And what did you say? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and at that point, I'm like, I, I, di I didn't know he loved me. I didn't know he was in love with me. I didn't know he was going to marry me. And then the minister said, well, let's get you baptized in the spirit. And I'm like, can we just have the marriage chat now? <laughs> And then I, I was uh, I was down in the spirit and uh for <laughs> and ours. In tongues. Yeah. <laughs> for ours. For ours. And I'm going, he's just told the minister we're gonna get married. <laughs> so he, he just he he got me on logic on that one. It was a if I if we were in love, um, then why wouldn't we be getting married, I suppose. But had I had I not had it presented to me like that, I, I would probably still be today fretting and wondering and, and all the rest. So yes, he got me he got me on the logic of it. And then the spirit got me uh <laughs> he got me on both sides that day. Yes. Mm. And actually wow. you were so full of the spirit for ours, I couldn't even ask you the question, what did you mean about the marriage? For ours and ours and ours. Anyway, hallelujah Jesus. And we've been married 23 years. 23 years what, favorite so movie, years. David? Go on, land yourself in it. Oh, it's <laughs> it's a bit, it's very sweary because it's Irish. So it's got lots of swearing in it. Sorry. It's the commitments. Um, There's an indictment I, of the Irish. <laughs> that Irish way where every second word is a swear word. Uh, uh, yes, yeah. the commitments. But uh, I haven't seen it for many years. But it's got soul music and trumpets and... Uh, comedy and Irish people. A lot of my favorite things all in one place. 
that's very kind of you. Okay, brilliant. Well, that's our time up. We've done enough controversy for today. Uh, just to remind you that Miracle um, Miracle Clinic, there are appointments. If you need a physical miracle or any other kind of miracle, jump on. I think the appointments have been open for the rest of May. Make sure you don't miss booking if you need a miracle that's live uh, and and open. And remember that you can join our um, uh, our association, the Global Prophetic Alliance. Um, we are uh, the membership is open, and when you join the Global Prophetic Alliance, yeah, you get to be part of our family, and um, you get access to core training for supernatural ministry every month. You get access to four coached practice sessions so you can grow in prophecy and healing and deliverance and dream interpretation and all of that. And you get us praying for you. You get to submit your prayers to us. You get discount at conferences. It's a whole amazing package. So make sure you join the Global Prophetic Alliance online. And I will be back, who am I back with? Uh, uh, Sam and Luke. And uh, we will be talking mental health, uh, dissociation identity disorder, more on demons, and some more of your very, very controversial questions. I don't know, am I brave enough to tell you about climate change? Whew, you'll have to wait and see on Thursday. See you then. Bye.